everyone, thank you for coming. It is a great pleasure to introduce uh, our today's uh, colloquium speaker, who is Professor Leonid Mirny from MIT. Leonid has received his PhD in biophysics from Harvard, uh, where after his graduation, he was a junior fellow of the Harvard Society of Fellows. He started his faculty position at MIT in 2001, where he's both at the physics department, as well as the health sciences and technology division. Since 2015, he has been co-director of the Center for 3D Structure and Physics of the Genome, both at the University of Massachusetts as well as MIT. His group's research focuses on biological physics and systems biology, mostly on the physical organization of genome, as you will see today. For his research, he has received numerous honors and awards, such as the William Milton Award, uh, Alfred Sloan Research Fellowships, uh, and he's also fellow of the American Physical Society. Today, we're going to learn and hear about the newest and latest in the physical organization of the human genome, <laughs> <laughs> where we have two meters inside of a very small 10 micrometer nucleus packed in a very peculiar way. So we're going to learn the details today and specifically how loopy our genome is. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. How is this late? Get the lights. 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 Okay. And you, you have to activate your chromatin there to make it realistic. What do I need to activate? I need to activate my... <laughs> Her chromatin was too yeah. dead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll tell you about physics of chromosomes and try to, sh to share my excitement of how how interesting the system is. So uh, kind of, I also think about this as physics of the genome because usually when we, when people talk about human genome, any genome, they imply that that's an information carrier, which it is, but it's also a physical object. So so that's an interesting implementation of the of the of the human genome as a physical object as a library. So in London, you can go to Welcome Collection, which is a museum of history of medicine, basically, and you can browse human genome. Stand and browse, so it's like a big stand. Um, and the question is, so what, 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 what is the actual physical implementation of the genome? So how does it all look like in space? And there are lots of sources. So there is a page of, in Wikipedia. Uh, that's an that's AP Biology textbook. Uh, that's the Natural History Museum in London, not too far from, from Welcome Collection. And they all kind of give you different pictures of how DNA is packed. And as Alexandra told you, so this are, there are two meters of, 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 uh, of the genome in every single cell, packed inside really small, small nucleus. Uh, yeah. Is there some reason why some of the bases are uppercase and some are lower? I don't know. <laughs> I realized this only after I took this picture, so I don't know. It's only one line. It's, it's you, all no, there, there, are some, there. there are some that are, I don't know, actually. It's a great question. I have no clue. I guess that's maybe, the one that makes you redheaded or something. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's an artistic expression of the guy who did it. Um, no idea. Maybe I know this is this your myself. Proof. It has the intros and the no, maybe, maybe this is coding DNA. Uh, uh, maybe. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Maybe it's a gene. It's in capital letters. Um, yeah, so actually my daughter asked me a good question. She, she asked, so like, in every cell we have two meters of DNA. So how much DNA do we have in all our cells? She said, ah, that's a good question. We have 10 to the 14 cells. So that means that in 10 people, that's going to be a light year. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, we have a light year of DNA. <laughs> uh, it's like, I don't know, scary. <laughs> Anyways, so, so how is it all organized? So you know there is a double helix of DNA. So this double helix is wrapped around histone cores, like small protein barrels. Uh, it makes one and a half turn around the, around the barrel. Uh, uh, and then that provides some linear compaction. So because you make a turn, and then you make another turn, and so on. I, I, I'm laughing because I recall the, so the story that a few years ago I got, I got an email from a CNN science journalist. And she wrote to me and said, okay, well, I want to talk to you. I said, sure, absolutely. So, so she called me and I was like, oh, she wanted to like, feature me. And she said, like, we have, it was in February, I think 2014, um, the Pi Day is approaching. 
We have a question. Do you use number pi in your research? <laughs> <laughs> Do I use number pi in your research? Say, okay, let me think about this. I'll call you back in a couple of days. <laughs> and then I realized that I do use number pi in my research because the linear shortening of this chain is the number of terms t turns times pi. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote this little piece for her, oh, made a drawing of this, like fountain crystal structure, so she wrote a little <laughs> Anyway, so, so, so that provides you maybe about like five-fold linear compaction. You still have centimeters of DNA. So that doesn't solve the problem of how this fiber is compact. It's still a very long fiber. Um, on the other end, if you look under the microscope, you know that there are chromosomes. So these are the first drawings of chromosomes by Walter Fleming, uh, a, a Dutch physiologist. So he was looking actually at prophase chromatids. At the end of the, of, the, of the lecture, I'll show you sort of modern sort of um, microscopy of chromosomes at this stage of the cell cycle. So, so the cell starts to compact its chromosome. That's why they're visible. And then if you do kind of relatively modern microscopy of, of the nucleus, you would see it. So the, in blue is DNA. This region is a very dense blue, um, might be for different reasons. So what's important here is that you can stain certain chromosomes in a different color. So you have paternal genome and maternal genome. So chromosome two is here, is here in red. So there is one copy of chromosome two and another copy of chromosome two, one copy of chromosome nine, another copy of chromosome nine. And the point is that first, every chromosome occupies some volume within the nucleus. And that's kind of surprising because I just told you that the length of, of the fiber, uh, total fiber of DNA is like tens of centimeters. So every chromosome is centimeters of DNA. Nevertheless, within a 10 micron, Nucleus, it's not like everywhere. It could have been. It's long enough, but it's compacted. <coughs> um, and the, the other point is that homologous chromosomes, paternal, maternal copy of the same chromosome, are not actually touching each other. They're somewhere in random places. At least in mammalian genome, that's the case. In flies, it's different. Uh, so but the question is, okay, so how is this fiber packed inside these things when the cell is just sitting there, not dividing. And then at some point, the cell will decide to divide, and it will start compacting chromosomes, getting this kind of packing chromosomes in this sort of elongated fibers. Um, so I'll argue that there are kind of, there are, kind of in the last, last decade, we realized there are lots of exciting properties of chromosomes from the physics point of view. So I'll talk about sort of something that uh, Shura worked on, and sort of myself, about uh, almost a decade ago, uh, kind of that showed that chromosomes are non-equilibrium polymer systems. Uh, late, again, there was a realization that chromosomes are essentially phase-separating block copolymers. And then most recent developments are the kind of show us that chromosomes are actually active systems moved by motors. And that was kind of, that's the most recent and exciting development. So before going into, into, into physics, I need to tell you about the main source of data. What really changed this field uh, about a decade ago was the invention of this method called HiC, uh, largely due to Gilb Decker, our collaborator. So what what you can do with high c without going into, into all the chemical details of this process is you can take a population of cells and you can ask a question for any two regions of the genome, how frequently are they touching each other? The touching needs to be defined, so sufficiently close to each other. So that would give you a map of which regions talk to which other regions. So these are these maps. So, so that's a fragment of such map. So, so the darker the area is, so why is this a map? Because it's a genome by genome. So this is actually part of a chromosome. So let's say chromosome by chromosome map. And so the darker the region, the more frequently two things are touching each other. So kind of if I look along the diagonal, so the diagonal is very dark because regions that are close to each other are touching each other very frequently. As I go further from the diagonal, they're touching each other less frequently. So, so that kind of makes sense. And then there are lots of features in these maps. So, so the method was, was published in 2000. Nine, almost, almost 10 years ago, in, I think in November or December. Um, and then, since then, this method has been applied to a variety of organisms and cell types. You can get a high C map of bacteria, uh, uh, yeast, uh, some plants, lots of different cell types in human, mouse, uh, flies, and so on. Um, and that immediately tells you something. For example, what does it tell you if you look at bacterial one? What, what is it? What, what can you tell about chromosomes in this bacteria from this map? It's circular, yes, but circular, circular will give you an enrichment here. Two ends are touching each other, so, but, but you also have this, what does it mean? Yeah, exactly, it's folded like that. It's not only circular, but it's like, 
yeah, and so you can you can kind of get certain things like from from just looking at these maps, and I'll show you. So so that's a, a that's a browser that that most of our collaborators, Niels Gellenborg from Harvard, developed and sort of his group, and I was I was part of this team because I was basically saying I want this feature, and they were saying yeah we can implement this, and I want that feature. No 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 that that will be that will have to wait. And so 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 one feature that I really want from this browser is an ability to to zoom in and out really fast, like Google Maps. And also to have like two windows where I can look at the wild type and the mutant or like different chromosomes <laughs> at the same time and then I can zoom in on two at the same time. Something that Google Maps don't, don't actually have. So they implemented this. So on the left, you'll see a high C map of a human genome right, in a particular cell type. On the right, you'll see um, a Google map. And as I zoom in twice here, I'll be zooming in twice there. So what are the squares? This is the squares here are chromosomes. I'll just be flying in, so into one of the chromosomes. And so, so one chromosome is like a big country in Europe or like a few states in the United States. You see some features on those scales. You see features uh, on the scale of like district in Boston. Some features even at the scale of buildings at MIT. And some features at the scale of the whole, world, of the whole world. So these are really amazing data. Because you see features at all scales. This bit, these dots, sizes of buildings. So, so this are, this are, this are indeed amazing data, not only because you have features, but also you have the huge dynamic range. You have, right now, you have six orders of dynamic range in this darkness. Yes. What is the smallest resolution? What does it represent? Like one molecule? Uh, one? The, one, so here, the pixels here, the pixels in this particular thing, one pixel will be one kilobase, one thousand bases. <coughs> so human genome, human genome is three 10 to the nine base pairs. So one, one pixel here is a thousand base pairs. Uh, in the new data that I actually have in another window in this browser, so uh, this is 150 base pairs, which is one, one particle of this thing that, is, that has DNA wrapped around it. So, so, so that's, this method is called, it's, it's a flavor of high C method called micro C. The white stripes are missing data. The white okay. Let me stop this before you get dizzy. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting dizzy. The white stripes are regions that are unmappable. So this can be repetitive regions of the genome. So that means so by by ver by the way it works, I need to read. P so the way it works. So let me let me step back. The way this method works, uh, you take population of cells, you add formaldehyde, it glues everything to everything. So every piece, every two pieces of, of, of the DNA that happen to be closed in space are now glued together. Then you connect them into a single DNA molecule and read this molecule by DNA sequencing. So indeed, if I, if I later, if I captured a piece of a repetitive genome, I wouldn't know where it came on the, on the chromosome. So I would discard it. Though as we discussed today with, with, with Alexander, we don't have to actually do this. We, we might be able to map some of these repeats. Um, yeah, so, so these are unmappable regions or maybe poorly assembled regions of the genome. Some regions of the genome are sufficiently uh, repetitive or have other problems, so, so they cannot be reliably assembled. In this particular cell type, that's a cancer cell line, some regions may be just distorted, and I don't want to deal with this kind of chromosomal breaks. I just say uh, I'm not going to help. Any other questions about this data? Okay, cool. So, so what? Well, so what can we do with this data as theoreticians? So we can process the data, we can look at the features, but at the end of the day, what we want, we want to have some sort of a physical model of the conformational ensemble that, rep that, that generates this kind of structures. So the way we do this is instead of using data to actually develop a model, we start modeling from some sort of first principles or first ideas, and then we implement this as a polymer model on a, in, for computer simulations, impose some, for example, interactions. I say, okay, what if these monomers interact in a particular fashion? And then I simulate this by molecular dynamic simulations, <coughs> generate enough conformations in this ensemble, and this could be an equilibrium ensemble, off equilibrium, active, so whatever. So I generate this ensemble, and then from this ensemble of conformations, I, I compute a high C-like map, essentially a contact map or a contact frequency map. And then I compare this map to reality, and I, and I see which features I, I can reproduce, with which features I cannot reproduce, so I can be more quantitative about this or less. So, so that's the overall approach. 
So I want to ask the question, what kind of interactions or what kind of processes can give rise to patterns that I see in, high, in, in real high CMA? So that's kind of the types of questions we can ask. Um, so let's talk about the first one. So, so the first feature that is evident from these maps is the contact probability. So what I told you. So if I look at the at this map, I have high intensity close diagonal, low intensity away from the diagonal, and for a second, I will abstract myself from all the details, from all these features. I will just compute how the intensity, average intensity, goes down as I'm going down from the diagonal. And I can look at this contact probability as a function of genomic distance. So essentially, if I compute something along this diagonal, that's the same as saying, what's the contact probability between two regions that are connected by a loop of lengths s? <coughs> and I can look, I can plot contact probability as a function of this genomic distance. And I can do it for the whole genome at once. That would be the black curve. Or I can do it for individual chromosomes and ask the phenomenon that I observe is the universal curve, or is this just a you know, fluke of a particular part of the genome? So these are individual chromosomes. They all show practically the same shape of this curve. And surprisingly enough, you can do a different cell line. It will give you a very, very similar shape of this curve. So, that was the, so that's basically what we started doing in 2009 in the first IC paper. We looked at this and we said, OK, this is a quantum probability as a function of, as a function of distance along the, along the chain. Um, what does it look like? You make it in a log log, you make this log log plot, say, ha, huh, the slope here is kind of close to one. Why? And what do we expect? And so, so for example, if this polymer, if I were to just take this polymer and fill some volume by this polymer, but let's say the, pol the volume is large enough so the polymer kind of can spread around, what might be the scale? Why does it scale as a power law and why, what, sort of what can be the scaling? And the answer is that the scaling should be close or maybe even steeper than three halves. Nevertheless, in real data, in, at least in human and mouse cells, it's very close to one. So it's certainly not three halves, which is not surprising because it basically tells me that uh, chromosomes are not. So a chromosome is not just a random polymer, randomly organized polymer. It has structures that are evident from this data. But also overall, it's not folded like a random walk. So it has, it has, it's, it's organized statistically somewhat differently, and it's universal and different organisms. You are showing, showing bacteria. There were uh, pictures of in, quite different. In bacteria, it's very different. Uh, it's universal among uh, vertebrates, at least. Uh, it's not. It's different in cerevisia, in yeast, and in fact, in yeast. I don't have this. In yeast, it's, it's very close to three halves, which actually kind of gives me, I don't know, like bumps on the skin. Uh, because I remember the first time I saw this, like, you have, you have data from real cells, like, you plot it in a log-log plot, and then you get the slope of, like, two, 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 the ratio of two integers, like three halves. It's supposed to be three halves if chromosomes were short enough, if they were essential random walks. And in Saravis, it's very close to that, because chromosomes are very short and nuclei are pretty large. Um, anyway, so, so we asked the question, why can it be close to, uh, to negative 1? And in doing so, we, we discovered this old paper. Oops. Ah, the order of things. <laughs> Sorry. OK. It's kind of weird. OK, I'll go to the next slide first. <sighs> OK, fine. Uh, I don't know how to make it do what I want it to do. Some kind of it's, it's with you, no matter how many times you test this. Uh, okay, so so that's from Shura's paper from 1988, and it will appear in a second on the screen. I don't know how to make it in the right moment in time. So basically, the question the question that uh, was asked back then is: if you take a polymer and you start compacting the polymer, subject to topological constraints. So so in other words, so if I if I start compacting this. And I, I want to make sure that this chain doesn't pass through, through itself. So it doesn't cross itself. So it can be collapsed, but, it, uh, but it, it wouldn't really kind of pass through. So it wouldn't get spontaneously knotted. So it may slowly get knotted. And the, and the, and the conclusion of this paper was that there are two phases of this compaction. 
First, it will get compacted into an unknotted state. And then very, very slowly, it would get knotted. If I, if I mush it on and off, like, and then pull it to ends, it may get knotted. Okay, I think I managed to do this. No? Yes, I did. So, but, but first it will get unknotted. And the question, so, so why we got attracted to this idea is that, so, so the other, the, the, the other, the, 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 the result of this analysis by Mucharev, uh, Grosberg, and Chaknovich was that as a result of that, so in the initial collapse, topological constraints would be locally compacting every, every chain, every subchain of this polymer. And it's effectively, every subchain would be compacted by its neighbors, and the whole system will be a globule of globules. So, so that's going to be an hierarchically folded system that is self-similar, and they called it fractal, crampled globule or fractal globule. Um, and we said, okay, that might be what we were looking for because we want, we want kind of one universal scaling, and the scaling is negative one, and there is an argument why it should be, it should correspond to, to um, essentially a hierarchical system of locally compacted structures. Um, and so back then we did simulations. That's what I was about to show, uh, where of a polymer collapse that is basically what I just did in the ends without letting it equilibrate for too long. And indeed, you get a scaling very close to negative one. Finally, this paper showed up. So it's in French general physics. Um, so so we, we essentially we said, OK, if we, if we essentially do what, what uh, Grossberg and Chaif and Chaknovich proposed in 1988, now 20 years later, so if we, if we simulate this, what kind of scaling do we get? And we get something very close to negative one. So OK, that's encouraging. So maybe. Real polymers are real chromosomes are actually this non-equilibrium polymers that did not have time to equilibrate, and if they stay long enough, maybe eventually they will equilibrate, uh, topologically equilibrate. Uh, and since then, uh, uh, again, Shura collaborated with Kurt Kramer, and they did more careful analysis of this topologically um, un unconcatenated, uh, topologically crumpled, unconcatenated rings. And that gave a slope of negative 1.17, 1.15. And again, we studied an unknotted globule, essentially what I played with, a single chain uh, that has no knots and compared this to the one with knots. And indeed, the slopes are different. With knots, it gets very close to negative one half. And without knots, it's kind of negative one-ish. And I don't think we have a good theoretical argument why it should be 1.17 or so. So it's still, it's still an open question. Um, but the take home message from this is that chromosomes are some sort of non-equilibrium unknotted polymers. And that's roughly where, where I think we, we kind of, at least as far as chromosomes, kind of we're still somewhere this 2000, basically a decade ago, uh, what, kind of what we achieved, we're kind of still there. We're not entirely sure we know why chromosomes remain unknotted. Um, why do we see the scalings? The scalings are indeed universal in all mammalian cells. We cannot, I don't know a single example. Okay, I know one example. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's very exotic. But basically it's kind of, I don't know a single example of a normal somatic cell that would, that would, give, that would give a scaling of negative three halves. Uh, yes, if a cell, if a nucleus is really huge, then things change. But is there some simple argument of getting the one over S? Shura has a simple argument. has a simple argument of getting the one over S. Uh, kind of like all scaling arguments, kind of it, it, it makes unrealistic assumptions and then kind of comes to, to the right answer. Uh, so I, I'm still kind of sign up for that for this argument. Basically, if the one over S means that uh, I don't know whether I should should go into this argument, but basically, if if a polymer is space filling. So if it's locally compacted in all scale, then uh, this chain would occupy some volume that's linear with the length of the chain. So the volume was go linear with S. So the probability for the second end to be where the first end was of the chain would go as one over the volume. So it would go as one over S. But that assumes that on every scale, the polymer is, com is locally compacted. But that should give us exactly negative one, and we never see exactly negative one. So it, it might be more exciting than that. But we, I don't think we understand this. So you said if 
if there were knots, you'd, you'd have this uh, stronger power law. But if there were knots, would that prevent the chromosome from being able to function properly? Like, yeah. That's that's what we hypothesized. That's what we said in the 2009 paper. We say, yeah, chromosomes are knotted. That's really cool. They can open up. We kind of argued that, that that would allow chromosomes to function properly. We don't know whether they're knotted or not. I, I wish we, we could we could find this out. But the knots don't prevent them from transcribing whatever they The knots, RNA. I doubt the knots would prevent them from transcribing. Kind of depends on the scale of a knot. Chromosome is on the scale of like oh, tens of microns. Transcription is like tens of nanometers, whereas three of magnet. Okay. I doubt knots would really have a huge effect. Okay. Plus, there is a special machinery to resolve knots. So the most critical moment for chromosomes is when they condense. And one, needs to, one goes to one daughter cell, another one goes to another one. At that moment, there is a machinery that resolves all the entanglements. So, so I don't think B not that would be a problem. It's possible that it's not entirely mathematically unnoted, but it's largely unnoted. And it's just a non-equilibrium state. There was a group that argued that if you expand from a very compacted state into an open state, you should, and the, you were unnoted there. Now you become big and unnoted. You, you, would, you, sh you should remain unnoted. You would get this negative one scale. Uh, now we have high C data that are time resolved as a function of this expansion. So we now have this data at, at five minute resolution. So you can do high C as a function of time as chromosomes expand back into their original state from this condensed one. So we have this data with your decker. I think it, it's still unpublished, but it's in, on the archive. So and we're trying to see whether we can learn something from this process by looking at this expansion. But it took two, 10 years for this technology to, to mature such that you can do it as a function of time. So I hope that we'll learn something from that. Um, we certainly now know that chromosomes are non-equilibrium sort of systems, and also would love to see whether the slopes would change as cells age, if they stop dividing. And we now have this data as well, so we start collecting this data, so like very old cells. So that's, that's doable. Um, okay, so, so, so that was the first short story. It's kind of incomplete, but it kind of shows, shows where, where we were and also what we would love to achieve in the future. The second story is, I think we have a better understanding, still incomplete, um, is about sort of block, block copolymers. So, so that's another feature of the high C map. Let's start with the high C map. Uh, you may have noticed this as I was doing this fly, fly in, but so here you can also notice that in this fragment of a high C map that it looks a little bit like a checkerboard. Ignore the block diagonal structure, I'll talk about this later, but first it's a, it's a checkerboard. You see these checkers, these checkers and so on. Uh, so what are these checkers? Um, I'll just highlight them here. So these things. Uh, when you see a map that has checkers, it basically means that you can decompose this into two types of stretches, and I will call the stretches A's and B's. So for, and it means that AA and BB interactions are enriched, and AB <coughs> interactions are depleted. So, so kind of operationally, if I see a map which looks like a checkerboard, I can always decompose it just by looking at the first eigenvector into this at least two types of regions. Um, so that was again done in 2009 um, in the first KIC paper. And then what was observed is that these B regions are particularly poor in genes, and A regions are particularly rich in genes. And what, what this picture tells you is that gene poor regions spatially segregate themselves from gene rich ones. Rich ones, and pe for people in Manhattan, the idea that rich and poor are segregated should be quite familiar, <laughs> um, especially the old one. Um, but basically, so, 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 so gene rich and gene poor regions are segregated in space. Uh, that's what high C map tells you. Microscopy at the same time can actually tell you where these regions are. And so this is about, this is early, late 1990s paper from, from uh, Thomas Kramer's lab. Um, and what it shows is that, that again, gene ac active regions with lots of genes, active not in the physics sense, but in the biological sense. So these regions are typically in the center of the nucleus. And regions where there are no genes are typically the nuclear periphery. So, so that's what was known from microscopy. Um, Okay, so now the question is, how can it work? How can a nucleus be separated into regions with gene, with gene poor stuff, B stuff, B compartments at the periphery, and A green stuff in the center, it's red, dots are 
uh, special nuclear bodies that like Alexandra studies, uh, nucleoli. So let's ignore them for a second. So, so these are very special things. Generally, A, B stuff is, is at the periphery, A in the center. Okay, you can say, so how can this thing, they separate? Well, it's not, it shouldn't be that hard. So the, in principle, there are like, the space of possibilities is limited. If I have a polymer that consists of stretches of A and B, <coughs> I can have attraction between A and A. I can have attraction between B and B. Or I can have attraction between B and what's called lamina. Lamina is a, is a, is a layer that decorates the nuclear membrane. So, so out there, there is lamina. So what is microphone separation? Microphone. That's oh <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. Oh my god, micro. That's that's a that's a that's a spell checker. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I should correct this. Sure. <laughs> correct this. <laughs> I think that's more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did it. It immediately changed. Oh my god. I tried to change it. But it keeps can't override this. I, I, had to, I had to override it now, actually. Yeah. That's funny. Because Microsoft, they don't want you to. Yes. Yeah. OK, <laughs> but, I, but it, did, it did. I just changed it, and it changes back to microphone. Like, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> OK, so spell so checker. Uh, OK, thank you for pointing out. Um, <laughs> being dyslexic, I don't know. Um, anyway, so, so, so these are the space of possibilities. And again, it's known that if you have any, any of these things, that would be enough to face, well, if they were sufficiently strong, if these interactions were sufficiently strong, that would be enough to, 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 to generate microphase separation, not microphone separation. Uh, and that's, again, that Schurer's textbook, uh, New Edition 94. These are some simulations from uh, um, uh, Binder Group. Uh, essentially, block of polymers if they have preferential interactions between types of blocks, tend to separate. OK, that's cool. Uh, which of this I actually operate in the cell? So that's the question. Which of these uh, possibilities are actually implemented in the cell? Um, and that's a collaboration with Irina Solovy in Munich and Jana Fyodorova in, in Bulgaria. Um, and what they were studying, what the Jana and Irina were studying, are really interesting um, biological system. And that's a kind of a cool example when you study something incredibly exotic and you, you learn some general principles. So what they were studying are cells that are called rod cells. So these are rods, these are nuclei uh, in the rods of nocturnal, in the retina rods, retina rods of nocturnal animals. So we're not noct nocturnal anymore. Big apes are not nocturnal. Uh, small apes, some small apes are, uh, and most of ma most of mammals are nocturnal. So in there, so they see really well at night, and the argument was so. So what they notice is that this nuclei in the rods are inverted. So their B stuff that has very few genes is in the center, and their A uh, chromatin is at the periphery. And generally, there is a belief that B is somewhat more dense, maybe twofold more dense, uh, as far as volume density of chromatin. And that would make them optically more dense. And they have a couple of papers demonstrating that this indeed leads to different optical properties, creating, uh, creating essentially a lens. So every rod cell is a little lens focusing light in another part of the same cell that is uh, photosensitive. OK, so that's an interesting um, exotic uh, situations so where you can get these cells to when you have these inverted cells. These are normal neurons. They have red at the periphery. These red blobs are either uh, nucleoli or special type again. So this is a kind of special type of heterochromatin. Uh, and then what Irina Solovey has shown over the years is that you can actually take normal cells and make them partially invert if you remove this layer of the lamina that decorates the nuclear envelope. If you remove this, this part of this envelope, then the, natural, the nuclei naturally invert over the course of a few weeks. They become a little bit like rods. And we say, OK, cool. That basically means that this phase separation of red and green have not, has nothing to do with um, 
with the lamina, so it should be either attraction of A to A and B to B. Uh, can we figure this out? So we've done high C on this, and that was the most useless thing we've, we've done, actually. <coughs> this high C for, invert, for normal and inverted look the same. Here it looks a little bit different because this new type of neuron is kind of weird, but you can compare this to other high C maps. This nuclei inverted, but they look normal. It's just checkerboard, individual chromosomes. You've seen high C data a few minutes ago, so you know that nothing special. So we said, okay, what can we, how can we use this information? Um, and we started working on this, and we said, so okay, maybe we, what we can do, we can do a polymer model and see whether we can reproduce this inverted architecture. Uh, and we said, we're going to do it like two types of chromatin and see whether we can reproduce this uh, results. And Irina said, no, 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 there are three types of chromatin. Okay. So there is apparently another type of chromatin, uh, particularly uh, abundant in, in mouse, called uh, chromocentus. So this, uh, this are essentially parts of silent, silent parts of the genome that are full of repeats. So they're invisible to high C, but they usually are sitting at one end of, of the mouse chromosome, close to the centromere. And you can, in, in, in microscopy, you can label them in different color, and this regions in inverted nuclei would be right in the center, and then uh, B regions would be around them, and A would be around those. So, so these are beautiful concentric structures, and I say, it should be a simple explanation of why you get this. And again, high C looks more or less normal, but high C allows us to quantify how strongly A and B tend to avoid each other. Um, so we said, okay, let's have a, a, a polymer model with three types of with three types of monomers, A, B, and C. And then to parameterize this model, I would need to have six interactions: A, 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 B, 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 and so on. And even if I consider all the relative strengths of these interactions, which one is stronger, I will have 720 classes of models that I will have to enumerate. So, okay, let's enumerate them computationally. So we tried 720 models, and for each model, you get, you get some sort of a phase-separated or not phase-separated picture. And then you compare these pictures to, to imaging. And you say, what are the best models? So here is the model number. And this is the, so they just sorted here. And this is the quality of the agreement with the, with the imaging. So these are the best models, and these are the worst models. And the first eight models can count it from zero. And if you're not, if you're not counting from zero, you're not hipster enough. Uh, so all, the, all, my, all my hipster students who code in Python, they start with zero. I'm, I'm a MATLAB person, so I started with one. Uh, but anyway, so, 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 so these are the first eight models. And I, they completely refused to do it, like, even for the paper. It's like from zero. Makes sense? Um, the first eight models, they all look like, not only, not only quantitatively, they look like imaging, but they kind of qualitatively look like imaging. And then you can get all sorts of weird models. You can get all sorts of mushrooms and, and Mickey Mouse ears and all sorts of things, depending on the relative strengths of these six parameters. Uh, so what's, co what's common about all these eight models? What's common about them is that uh, CC interactions are the strongest. BB are next. Again, BC is, should be in between. BC we, we actually constrain to be a geometric average of, of BB and CC such that you have a good interface. Uh, BB is next, and AA is the weakest. And the freedom is actually the position of AC. AC can be anywhere because A doesn't really touch C much. So that's essentially a free parameter that can be anywhere and that nothing changes. Uh, but in all these models, CC was the strongest. BB in the middle, and AA can be actually set to zero. We say, okay, that's good. So let's set AA to zero. Let's fix CC to whatever it needs to be the strongest. And then the only free parameter that I have is the BB. Because all the, all, the, all, the, all the mixed ones will be chosen such that I have a good, strong interface. Um, so with that, I can, I, I, I can tune BB such that I can reproduce both imaging and IC. And so it gives me a number how strong BB is. But the take home message from this is that to reproduce an inverted nucleus, what I need, I need super strong interactions between heterochromatin, between repeats. I need sufficiently strong interactions between non-repetitive heterochromatin, silent heterochromatin, and then active heterochromatin where all the genes are shouldn't really stick to each other. It doesn't have to interact strongly with each other. Actually, the best is that it, it, 
it's basically setting this value to zero. So that what gives me an inverted nucleus. Now I can say, OK, how about a conventional nucleus? Say, so, OK, now I will take this model, and I will add interactions to the nuclear lamina. And I know that I need to add B to the lamina and C to the lamina interaction. So I have two more parameters to, again, to, to find you by trying to match the high C data for the conventional nucleus now. And the answer that, that reproduces both imaging and an imaging like C is at the pre-free and B is over here. To reproduce this, C to the lamina essentially should be irreversible. It should be essentially anchored to the, to the lamina. And B, should be, B lamina should be approximately the same as BB, which is relatively weak, less than a KT per monomer here. So that would give me an invert a conventional nucleus. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because it's kind of interesting how chromosomes are organized in space. It tells you that it kind of answers the question last. So how does it all work? AA interactions, and I will remove C from this discussion. It's not very special. So AA interactions are irrelevant. So genes are doing their transcription. You transcribe, you read DNA from the genes. But it's not about interactions between the genes that make this phase-separated nucleus. Um, you get this compartmentalization because there are attraction between B regions. And you, 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 you position B at the periphery by another type of interaction. And it actually makes little sense because it basically tells you that inverted state is the default state of the nucleus. By default, it should be heterochromatin in the center and euchromatin, active chromatin at the periphery. Somehow, nature prefers the other orientation. So inverted is new conventional. So it wants essentially invert this default state into what we know as conventional nucleus. And we have no idea why, why nuclei are organized in this way. We just know that it's driven by heterochromatin. What is the molecule that mediates these BB interactions? What's the actual physics of this? It's still unknown. And there are many hypotheses what this could be. Um, so so that was my story. So, so basically, my, my point is that genome is a very nice block copolymer. Uh, here, there are more colored types. But to the first approximation, you can say there are two colors, green, <laughs> blue, and red, or red like colors. Um, and they, they, face, they, they, they essentially microphase separate. So what else do we see in high C data? There are other features that are very, very interesting. And so in the last 15 minutes, I'll talk about them. So this are uh, these block, block uh, diagonal structures, these little squares next to the diagonal. Um, and they attracted lots of attention when they were discovered. So I'll talk about them. So now I will talk about the main, but not compared, but the mains mostly, and how they are formed by the, by the active process. Um, so what are these domains? Um, so, so they can be easily seen in high C maps. They believe to be functional are very important, and I don't want to go into details why. Briefly, what's believed to be happening is that the genome is being split into neighborhoods with more interactions within each neighborhood and few interactions between these neighborhoods. And all the regulatory sequences in the DNA are acting largely on the genes located within the same neighborhood. So that's the idea, that your genes are regulated by some switches, and the switches should be located within the same neighborhood. And it turned out that the solution, that the mechanism of domain formation, turned out to be very similar to the mechanisms that, are, that gave answers to two other puzzling things that was, so these two problems were actually bothering me for quite some time. One is how can chromosomes condense into something that's elongated? That's, that's kind of, the, remember I showed you these pictures from Walter Fleming from the 19th century, that when chromosomes condense, they become elongated. That's really weird, because if I take a polymer and I condense it by minimizing its surface area, it's going to be something like spherical. It shouldn't be, it should, there's no reason why it should be like elongated when it's condensed. That's one problem. The second one is that if, if, this, if this polymer were painted in the rainbow fashion, like red to yellow to orange, red to orange to yellow to green and so on, in this condensed state, there is a memory of the linear location. So, so this part would be like folded here. The next one would be folded there. So it's like essentially you preserve the genomic order of the chromosome in its linearly compacted state. It's hard to do it with your hands. So, so, so that's the other puzzling thing. And the other one is even more puzzling. If you have two copies, two copies of a chromosome after replication, so it's not maternal and paternal, 
This, called, this is called sister. So you have one chromosome, say paternal chromosome number five. And then it gets replicated, and now these two copies are next to each other, and they need to go to two separate daughter cells. Now, before they, before they get compacted, they're kind of intertwined. And now, when they get compacted, they compact separately from each other. And that's really puzzling, because molecules that compact them cannot tell them apart. They're chemically indistinguishable. Nevertheless, they compact into two separate objects. How can, how can it work? And the underlying theme here is that in all of this, all of the structures are formed by proteins that are much smaller than these chromosomes. Basically, three orders of magnitude smaller. So this is micron, and proteins are nanometer sized. So how can something much smaller form structures like that? And I will start, start by telling you about domains. Um, so the problem of domain formation is also interesting, because basically what was found experimentally is that what's important for formation of domains is what sits at the boundary. So a protein that sits at the boundary is important for forming this domain and that domain. If you remove this region of DNA, the two domains would merge. And that's really puzzling from the physics point of view, because it means that something that's nanometer sized controls whether these two blue dots will or will not talk to each other, or how frequently they will talk to each other. And this thing is like hundreds of nanometers away on a chain that's centimeters long. So how can it control something very, very far? Um, and some reviews will draw in even things like this. There was a wall in the nucleus. That was even before Trump. <laughs> um, and so notice that's made out of tiny atoms. The Berlin Wall was way before Trump. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it was inspired. I should check who the authors are. And I take a risk of showing this and making fun of this picture, but I actually don't remember who, who published it. Um, anyway, so, so, so the question is how can it work? So we ask polymer models to, we use polymer models to ask this question. We try different things. So we have a big polymer system, and we try different models of what can be at the boundary. We say, what if the boundary is bulky and hairy? And it kind of, can it insulate? And the answer is, it can insulate at the scale of this polymer object that's at the boundary. It cannot insulate very far. So we say, okay, that's a bad model. So we try the model where boundaries are long, uh, long and flexible. So I replace this thing with a long and flexible chain. Again, it does not really provide any considerable insulation between two domains. So it does not create domains. Finally, you can say, what if boundaries are sticky proteins that stick to each other? If there are sticky proteins that stick to each other, you would get these dots on the map. But you're not going to get squares like I should. So that didn't work either. Um, and the answer that did work came while we were working on, on, on the process of compacting the mitotic chromosome, problem that I, that I mentioned already, uh, and one uh, one, one idea that, that was how chromosomes can be compacted comes from, from a fellow physicist, John Marco, who suggested that there might be a process that he called DNA loop extruding process. So the idea that John had is that there might be an enzyme that lands on DNA, I will use this, that lands on DNA and progressively forms a larger and larger loop, something like that. Uh, he thought that might be even kind of not with an enzyme, maybe effectively you create this kind of loop. So it wasn't entirely clear what this might be. But we said, okay, if this process actually is happening, so it may help us solve this problem of domains. So we have an enzyme that can land on DNA and form a progressively larger loop. When this enzyme falls off the DNA, the loop would open up, and then I can come up with some rules for what happens when two such motors meet. They would block each other on this side, but they would continue reeling DNA in on the other side. So we said, okay, fine. Let's add one more rule, is that there is a boundary element. So if this if motor comes to a boundary element, it stops on this side, but it keeps reeling DNA in on the other side. What w can this give me domains? So we set up big simulations. So, so this is our simulated system. We, have, we simulate uh, 36 domains at once. So this would be one loop extruder modeled as a harmonic bond that is progressively moved to further and further to different monomers. As this whole polymer jiggles and wiggles in, in molecular dynamic simulations, and so, so then we, we also put boundaries somewhere here in this, in this polymer system. And then we ask the question, what kind of high C map or contact frequency map can this generate? And the answer was that it generates a really beautiful map with nice insulated squares. It also gives us these dots and, 
and stripes that were not seen actually in the original high sea, uh, that was 2015, uh, 14 actually, and that was the time when the high resolution high sea came out, showing all the stripes and dots and all these kind of nice structures. And we said, okay, that's cool because it looks like what we're seeing in, in simulations is actually makes sense. Um, we said, okay, that's a hypothesis. Let me skip through some stuff. Um, so that's a hypothesis. So what can be this loop extruding enzyme? And we hypothesized that this loop extruding enzyme is a protein of the big class called SMC, SM structural maintenance of chromosomes. And known proteins of this class are cohesins and condensins. So is it possible that cohesins are molecular motors that extrude loops? So that was a wild hypothesis. It was actually well accepted by chromosome community, but people who were studying these molecules for 20 years would say, no, 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 no. They're not motors. They're not motors. So, so they, they're just rings. Uh, we've never seen them having any motor activity. So it, there was lots of criticism. We said, okay, so we, we just make a hypothesis. We just what make a prediction. What does it mean, extraction? So, so that basically means that it kind of, it, it sits, it, it lands on DNA, and it makes a loop that is bigger and bigger. <laughs> it makes progressively larger loops. So, so the two hands will be one enzyme. And that you call extrusion. That's what we call extrusion, exactly. And the question is, can this really happen? So um, I'll show you some experiments. So and you can do lots of experiments to test this model. For example, you can remove this enzyme from the cell and see what's going to happen to these domains. I can show you. So that's a fragment of a map with this kind of squares. It depends on the quality of the projector that you can see. And then you remove this enzyme, and all the structures disappear. Now I'll zoom out now. So that's a zoom out of this, <coughs> another fragment of this map. You see all the structures. They all go. go back, structure the back. It also shows you that the checkerboard stays, large line perturbed, meaning the checkerboard is formed by another process. And you can do lots of other experiments. You can, for example, make predictions for what would happen if you remove boundaries, or what would happen if you put too many of these proteins, you would predict it to look like this. Um, it would, it would start from a grid of dots. Uh, if you remove boundaries, it would also, it would also lose the do these domains. Um, Wait, th these were based on, these are experiments. This, these were predictions. predictions. Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. These were experiments. Okay. These were experiments. Uh, these are now predictions. And the predictions are that, so if this is a wild type, and that's the curve that gave me negative one over here, but over there it has a shoulder. And we argue that the shoulder is because there are extruded loops. Now, if I remove this enzyme, the prediction is that the enzyme, that the, the shoulder should disappear, and that should be one long negative one, or close to negative one curve. So in other words, the shoulder, the curve should go this way. If I remove boundaries, domains would disappear, but the curve should not change because there are still loops, but they're just not stopping at the boundaries. That's the idea. Uh, and, and finally, if I put too many loop extruders, there are going to be too many loops, and I will start seeing more of these dots, that uh, these are interactions between boundaries. Because that's where this loop extrusion process kind of pauses or stops. Moreover, because loops will get bigger, the curve should shift to the right. So these are all three predictions. And these are experiments. I showed you already one of them. But so now I will show, so this is wild type before I did any perturbation. So here I will get rid of the enzyme, the machine. Here I will get rid of the boundary protein. And here I will, get, I will put too many machines. And the curves, again, the prediction is that the curves, the contact probability curve should go down, should stay, or should go up. So let me show first look at the maps. Domains disappeared, as I showed you earlier. The curve indeed shifted to the left. Domains disappeared because I removed boundaries. The curve stayed the same because there are still extruded loops. And if I put too much of the extruder, the curve shifted to the right, and I got these dots as I expected. Is it, is it clear? OK. So that was all nice and cool. So this was 2017. 
Uh, but people are still critical. And they were saying, this is all nice. We don't know how it works. But nobody has seen loop extrusion happening under the microscope. So, so this is very indirect. That's cool. But can somebody see this? And I was going around and talking to people doing single molecule experiments. And everybody was saying, like, nobody has seen this process. Like, give me a break. Leave it. It's, it's nice. This is theory. Uh, until another fellow physicist was brave enough, Hayes Decker, so yeah, he, he decided to test this. Uh, so he attached a piece of DNA to the glass slide, added a flow of buffer so the DNA would stretch out, and added the protein of the same SMC class con called condensin, and that ATP. We'll see what's going to happen. So this is piece of DNA. Protein gets activated. You get this very nice loop extruded. I can play this again. It's a very, very nice experiment. <coughs> so that was early 2018, last year. So that's a different protein. It's not cohesion, it's condensing. It's, it's close relative. So again, a piece of DNA. The protein binds here. And you'll see how it looks. You see this law on exclusion. That was the first demonstration of loop exclusion. And we were obviously very happy about that. But the plot actually thickens from this point on. Because what they observed experimentally is loop exclusion. We plotted this. I visited the case in, in Delft. He called me and said, you should count me and see what you have. Absolutely. Then he visited us in Boston. Job Decker and myself, we had pictures like me and double Decker. Like <laughs> But then there is one problem, and that's a work of Ed Bannigan in, in my lab now, for what he was a postdoc with John Marco, is that in experiment, the extrusion was one-sided. This molecule lands, and it reels DNA on one side. In the theory, we assume that DNA can be reeled in two sides. And the question is, can such mortar do what two-sided extruders can do? And one thing that two-sided extruders can do, they can compact DNA. I will show you this movies in a second. But it compact DNA, extrude everything into loops. And we say, so can? One side that extrudes that they so experimentally compact loops and they c compact the whole DNA into loops, essentially loop after loop after loop, so everything would get much shorter. And it turned out that if you have one sided extrusion, there is a mathematical limit. So it turned out to be a solvable problem. It's like very nice and pleasing. We can solve something exactly. But there is a maximal compaction, and it's just a number 4 plus 4 log, log 4, which is approximately tenfold. So it means that if I take a chromosome and I let this machines act on it, it will compact chromosome at most tenfold, which is great for yeast, and the protein was from yeast. And human chromosomes need to be thousandfold compacted. So it's not going to work for human chromosomes. Uh, and said, so, okay, what can we do about this? So, so we just say, so this somehow human, human condensins and cohesins should be two-sided extruders. So we know that this experiment is great. It shows it gives the proof of principle, but it should work somewhat differently. And so that was earlier this year. And then Case Decker has a bioarchive uh, where they looked more carefully at the enzymes. And they're saying they form what they call Z loops that can be symmetric motors that real DNA on both sides. Now they're seeing two-sided extrusion. So this prediction seems to be confirmed to an extent. And then uh, down Broadway at, at uh, Columbia, Eric Green, studied human condensing again, it's another archive, all of this is still unpublished, uh, where they also observed symmetric and asymmetric, mixture of symmetric and asymmetric extrusion. Uh, for some condensants, 50-50, for another one, it's slightly symmetric. So that, again, should work. And again, most recently, as of September, <laughs> basically a couple of months ago, a uh, conference in Vienna, where the lab of Jan Michael Peters from uh, from IM IMP in Vienna, did a similar experiment, but now for cohesion. And uh, that was a surprise talk at the conference, unannounced in the program. Mm -hmm. they, they played as well. Um, and they, sa they saw similar things. It's a similar setup, and you start seeing kind of loops getting extruded there. So cohesion is a two-sided extruder. So that's what they demonstrated. So to wrap this up, um, 
Basically, what we see now is that there are strong evidence, there is strong support for the loop extrusion mechanism. And we clearly see that there are two separate process folded, uh, two separate processes are folded in the genome. There is loop extrusion that creates these domains. And at the same time, there is some sort of a block of polymer structure that creates larger phase separation of the genome. Um, and I will skip through some of the stuff about mitotic compaction. I'll just show you that if loop extrusion can act on two mixed polymers, the problem that I formulated earlier, then uh, that's enough. Assuming that two chains can pass through each other, so it can resolve entanglements, that will be enough to form two compacted chromosomes, something that looks like, at least in simulations, like compacted chromosomes, and the colors separate. You get this nice compaction and segregation by the same process. And, and now we have some experimental evidence supporting the notion that this is achieved actually by loop extrusion by condensants. So you nicely segregate two chromosomes. Now they're ready to go to two daughter cells. Uh, I will skip through the experiment, so, uh, and just some risk here. Basically, what loop extrusion can achieve, it can segregate chromosomes in, if it's done by condensing, it's very, very powerful, mod high efficient motors. It can create domains if you put stop signs. And it looks like it's a very interesting universal process driven by motor. And now we start seeing what these motors are. So as of, as of this year, we now have strong evidence that loop exclusion is a reality, not only fantasy of us and John Marco. Uh, and finally, just to um, tell you that basically now what I try to communicate to, to you is how beautiful the physics of chromosomes is, that we see lots of interesting physical phenomena uh, in the form of non-equilibrium polymer systems, phase separating block polymers, and this active process that can come back to chromosomes. With this, I need to thank all the fantastic people in my lab who started this, this, this gang of people now in different places. Uh, in fact, the whole loop extrusion modeling started with, with a high school student, Carolyn Lou, because uh, graduate students didn't want to do this risky project. They said, okay, let, let Carolyn do this, and so, so she started doing the simulations, and when it started to come together something nicely, so graduate students started helping her. So, <laughs> 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 it's fine. so she, she graded from MIT actually already. Um, and then we continued this exploration at Bennigan, most recently, most recently became the most active sort of postdoc in the group, sort of looking at this one-sided exclusion and other mechanisms, and obviously sort of Job Decker, John Marco, all the people whom we collaborate on the experimental side. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> in the inverted nuclei, do they have the regular lamin structure on their envelopes? No, they don't. They, they, don't have, they, they have lamin A. So I'll give you a part of it. They have lamin A. They don't have, uh, okay, sorry. They have lamin B, but they don't, do not have anchors that anchor heterochromatin to lamin B. I see, I see. What's called LBR, lamin B receptor. So, so they, they don't do have the interaction of your like B lamina interaction. No, they, they don't, don't have, have that. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Inverted nuclei, they lose this interaction with the lamina, and that would make them invert. Mm -hmm. And you can even de-invert them back. There were beautiful experiments by Irina where you can take an inverted nucleus, express lamina, and wait and they de-invert uh, back. They, they become conventional. So, so that's very nice. That's very system. cool. David, so if, if I understood correctly, uh, you said that yeast have one-sided ex uh, loop extruders. Yes. Is it possible to modify yeast so that they have two-sided loop extruders and see what that does to the nucleus? Great, great question. I'm sure people will try doing this. Yeah, and and uh, it's there are some ideas how you can do this. You can express maybe human cohesion there. Yeah. It looks like at least condensing there is one sided. Cohesion, another beast might be two sided, but it's unclear. Uh, it's all, as you've seen, so this all the results are from the last couple of months, really. Yeah, but that would be very interesting. Can you, can I overcompact these problems? Yeah. 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 Sure. I have a question. I think I know the answer to this question. <laughs> but I want to hear what you okay. think about it. Uh, 
it seems on the surface of things that your chapter one and chapter two are contradicting one another. Because in chapter one, you said that this polymeric system is non equilibrium. And in chapter two, you said, oh, energy this, energy that. Let, let's run it in molecular dynamics, see how equilibrium phase separation look like, and blah, 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 blah nocturnal animals, and so on. <laughs> so, but it, it's not equilibrium in the first place. So what, what do you think? Well, it, 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 it makes me hard to sleep, like I, I wake up at night with this thing. <laughs> uh, but no, that's true. So I, I don't know how, it, how these two things can be, can be put together at once. Uh, my thinking about this, I can tell you what, what my secret is. My secret is that I don't think that the polymer, that chromosomes are non-equilibrium in this sense. I think that there might be something that keeps them from getting knotted. Uh, I suspect that, are, that your model of melt of rings is actually closer, your equilibrium model of the melt of rings is actually, might be closer to reality that what, that the non-equilibrium picture of yet unknotted chromosome. That there might be something that prevents it actively from getting involved. That's actually very close to my explanation. Okay. I think that indeed this type of, of lack of equilibrium when you are protected by topological constraints from further equilibration, that would lead to equilibrium work. Within this metastable domain, you will have quasi-equilibrium segregation. That's another possible that you just you just it's enough time to it's enough time to face separate but right. not enough time to get knotted, basically. Exactly. That, that's another possibility. But my impression now is that there might be some other mechanism that prevents chromosomes from getting knotted and maintains them territorial. That's not, it, may not, it may be time, but it might be another thing, essentially some giant loops. Do we have any more questions? Yes. In biology, we think there are uh, these loader proteins for loop extruders which only bind a subset of positions in the DNA. So if we simulate in such a way that Olympic extruders can only enter as certain positions, mm -hmm. are you still capable of recapitulating okay. the data? Uh, I'll try to give a short answer. So I'll, I'll come to me, talk to, I'll tell you more about this protein that you're, you're asking. But basically the question was, in my, in my naive model, I allow these loop extruders to land wherever they want, extrude loops and live wherever they want. Uh, there are some evidence that those loop extrudes are loaded only at specific places. My answer to this, I don't need this assumption that they're loaded at specific places. So, so my model works even if I don't assume this. But now there are actually new evidence saying that the old evidence should be thrown out of the window, uh, that there are no specific loading sites. So, so that's, some, that's again something from the last couple of months. Wonderful. Let's thank the brilliant again. <laughs> let's continue with wine and cheese on 8-4. Mm. Mm. Right. Oh, wonderful. Yes, yes, yes.